we're looking once again for one of the lesser known 8-bit machines from the 80s. This time it's a machine that was designed in Hong Kong and originally released in Germany. Right, here it is in its box, a little bit tattered, but it's all right by me. So, uh, it's stuck on there as well, but we won't try to remove it. So yeah, I guess we get around to unboxing. It's quite large and I am in the way of everything when I'm trying to get this unboxing done. So, There we go, the Color Genie EG2000. It's a fairly striking machine. <laughs> and kind of these brown and cream tones. Uh, I do not know what that is. Is that volume or something? Oh, well, that went out. I've got a manual, it's fine. It's a bit grubby, but it's in pretty good condition other than that. Yeah, the cable is connected, the power lead. Uh, see a British plug. Um, and uh, yeah, we probably have a power LED up there speakers uh so that would suggest there is volume possibly i don't know it's a weird symbol we'll check uh rather not a bad keyboard you know what it, it feels it's very got good travel it feels quite weighty as well when you push it and it's got a nice click <laughs> it's very important uh well laid out as well uh function keys down the side uh what else we got let's turn to one side so yeah, we've got a light pen and a serial port and a parallel port there. And on the back, there's our cassette port, uh, some kind of extension port, the audio and video, so some composite, nice big power switch, lead obviously, and that I think is it. That is indeed it, so yes. So let's get the cable back up on the table. Can we? Smash. I'll try not to. So yeah, I like it. It's lovely. The little colour splash up here is really nice and that's in, that's raised as well. So that's really uh, kind of nice. So anyway, <laughs> now there are some things okay in the auction. They did have this turned on. It was displaying a picture, but I noticed that the power LED was not on. Now, there are a couple of things that might say. If you're very pessimistic, you might say that this wasn't the machine that was being <laughs> shown as being on. Uh, I think instead that it's probably going to be that they, either the LED is blown or the power block is having some trouble. I'd probably go with the power block is having some troubles. Um, that's fine. We're going to need to do uh, some work on it. These internal power supplies get a lot more uh, hassle than the external ones. They, they overheat more and what have you. So they generally require some kind of uh, work on them. Um, there's no smell of burnt paper about it, so there's no reefers gone mad. Don't know if there are any reefers in there, so we'll find that out. Uh, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> I guess we will try and power it on for one time. Just, you know, they had it powered on already, so if there's something wrong then it's already happened, so we may as well give it another try. The Color Genie is based on an NEC clone of the Z80 with a Motorola 6845 handling the graphics. It's effectively an evolution of its predecessor, the Video Genie. Uh, no color in that title because it wasn't color. <laughs> uh, the original Vin Video Genie was similar to the TRS-80 Model 1, although with enough software and hardware changes to differentiate it from a straight clone. Uh, there were some compatibility though, and software could be ported with relative ease. Because of this, you'd sort of assume the next model would try to retain that compatibility with the subsequent Radio Shack computers, but it doesn't. Instead, the TRS-80 line really wasn't a continuation. Uh, it was more a collection of machines with a similar name, and later machines didn't even use Z80s as their main CPU. So, 
by being an actual follow-up and mostly compatible with its forerunner, the Color Genie lost that generational compatibility. Not that they were ever aiming for that anyway, but that's kind of an interesting uh, step. Uh, the Color Genie could not really compete with the market when it released, especially in the UK, despite boasting a fairly competent sound chip in the General Instruments AY38910, the rest of the specs didn't make for a great power to cash ratio. It started with just 16k of memory, which could be upgraded to 32k, and the experience with the Spectrum showed that 16k machines very quickly lost favour. The graphics were rudimentary at best, with even the Sinclair Spectrum, easily the weakest of the big 8 bits, besting it in a lot of areas. Unfortunately, the Color Genie could not even replicate the moderate success its big brother had in the UK market, with not even the pretty good keyboard being able to save it. But it did have some success in other parts of the world, uh, especially Germany, it's uh, the country it was introduced into and where quite a lot of the software comes from. Okay, so loading games didn't go quite as smoothly as I was expecting it to. I was hoping I could just use a, uh, a Casduino. This is one I designed myself, but um, I don't think the gain's high enough. Now I can fix that by replacing the LM386 for a different model, or by just changing some of the capacitors. But uh, I haven't got time for that, so <laughs> instead we are going to be using this, which is a slightly more uh, antique method of doing things, let's say. So yep, yeah, this is a normal tape player, this is a WH Smith player, uh, which people in the UK will recognise that name. Um, and this is, I got this as part of a Spectrum bundle quite a while ago. It does still work, um, surprisingly no maintenance has been done on this at all, and it just worked, which is shocking. Um, it's even got this note here, which is, I guess, from the original owner, where it says, Note set volume to approx 8, which, <laughs> if you've ever used tape-based computers, yeah, there's there's a finesse to getting those working. Um, now, obviously, I don't actually have any uh, tapes for the Genie, but I do have this. And what this is, is a Bluetooth cassette adapter. It literally says it right there. So, this pretends to be a uh, cassette tape and you can play music through it using devices. Now there are versions of these with wires and you plug them into uh, audio devices and they'll play through that. This one uses the Bluetooth thing which is nicer. I've even modified it. It used to have a wire coming up here with the control but I've actually put all that inside now so the on off button is there. Um, no idea if you can see any of this by the way because uh, I can't see the screen. Never mind. Um, so yes, yeah, so what we'll be doing is putting this in here and using my laptop to play the sound via Bluetooth to this. I know this works already, by the way, I have tested it, by the way. Normally, I do these things on the fly, but I did test this. It was slightly complex to get working, so I tested it first. Uh, yeah, so we just put this in just, oh, you know what, we need to turn it on first. We could just put it in, but it won't do anything. So I'll uh, move my laptop, because I'm pretty sure, yep, we've got the screwdriver there, so we can just kind of reach through here and hold this button down. There we go, and we get this little flashing set of lights, which says that it's waiting to be paired with something, so we can put that in, come on, in there now. Yeah, the door's a bit finicky, yes, but <laughs> it does work. And uh, now if I open up my laptop, I can pair using Bluetooth to that. Yep, and we already are. And then basically what I'll do is I will just use Audacity to load up a WAV file. Now this first WAV file I got, I got thanks to, where is it, there it is, uh, thanks to Lau Scott Bloke on, uh, on Twitter. Kylie kind of sent me a WAV file for what well, is effectively Jetpack. Uh, so, I'll show you it, it's not really much to show, but there you go, that's just that. We're connected via Bluetooth to the Z ZHX88, which is that thing in there. We can control the volume using our actual laptop, and we'll get like there's like a little uh, sound dial here, which I'll try to get video of as we play. But anyway, let's turn this on and hope the capture device picks it up and it turns on again, still, obviously. Right. There we go, now it's color. Uh, so we just push enter, return to member size. 
There we go. Now we have to type in system. And that gives us this prompt. This says we're loading up a binary program. Now here's a good thing with this uh, with this machine. Each cassette required you to put in like basically the program ID for what you were loading up. So for this one it's A. Um, but <laughs> they're not all the same effectively. So we have to um, this over here. I'm getting tons of uh, messages that you don't want to see. I don't want you to see them. I think it's more honest way of saying that. Um, yeah, so each one's got its own little identifier, and if you don't know it, you can't load the game. Uh, and normally they're only put on the cassette inlay or on the cassette itself, so it's quite tricky to find out to load these games up. But for this one, we know it is just A. So we can push A and do return. And now that's waiting for us to load. So we push play on this. Uh, no, we won't. What we'll do is we'll turn this on, because, you know, that's important. And we'll push play on this, or load, because it was designed specifically for computers. Right, so you keep an eye on the meter there. That, the needle should move when we hit play over here. So here we go. There we go. It's jumped up to the middle, which is good. And we can see on the screen that it's found astronaut, and we've got a little blinking cursor there, which will... which shows that we're actually loading up data which is good. Um, I'll leave this running real time, but I will put a chapter mark at the end of it, just so if you want to skip, you can just hit the skip button, but just to show you basically how long it takes to load. It's not terrible. It's 1200 board, but it's not a very big program either. So yeah. Um, I don't know if that brown line down, the, I really should look it up. I don't know if that brown line down the left is something normal, if it's something weird going on. Um, hard to tell. We'll take a look inside probably a bit later. We are coming near the end now. There we go. It has loaded up Ashenor, which again, if we just, uh, okay, this is gonna be difficult because the controls over there and I'm over here. So, okay, cursors and, okay, I'm not going to be able to replay this, but you'll see that it is absolutely Jetman. Oops, I've died. <laughs> yeah, so it is completely Jetman, I can't... Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely Jetman. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's loaded up from Bluetooth. Oh, we can stop the tape now. Didn't stop it, but it doesn't matter. It's not playing any data. Yeah, so that's loaded up from tape uh, from a, a Bluetooth tape deck, which is I re really interesting. Um, I mean, I won't go into how this works. It's not the point of this video, but it's basically got, I guess, what we call a record head on that side. So it just acts like it's recording the data. The other side, the tape reader picks that up and it's just meant magnetic data at the end of the day. So yeah, the tape door on this is a little bit wonky, but it's been dropped. This tape that's been dropped a couple of times because it was used as a prop in a theatre um, play. So uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's got a couple of things wrong, but the actual mechanism works fine, which is amazing after all this time. Anyway, okay, right, well, let's, uh, let's open her up. yellow marks as a result of something that my patrons may see a video about at some point. <laughs> Let's just say a failed experiment. Anyway. On the bottom we can see some interesting uh, and useful information about uh, see the voltages and also the channel they expect it to be tuned onto. It's a problem for us because we're using composite. screws came out which is always good because it means they're going to go everywhere when we turn it back up. Okay they didn't. Sure not captive screws. 
Now, has this done the... Uh, Screws out that way. That's a second there. I thought they'd put screws underneath the foot pads, but it doesn't look like they have. Let's move those three screws there. Carefully. Okay. Well, so there's a couple of um, connectors. The main keyboard connector back there. Oh, and the LED connector, which literally just popped off. So that might explain some why it's a bit intermittent. Um, right, well, there's not a huge amount of capacitors in here, which is good. This is probably where a lot of our issues are coming from, or will come from, or maybe don't even exist, who knows. Again, the LED might just be because that was not connected very well. Uh, right, well, let's get the keyboard out entirely. Where possible, pull from the plastic rather than the wires, although quite hard. Mm. Stuck in somehow. Not seeing any grips. room for that sir. Yeah there is right. Okay. Uh, what about this side? Does it come out from this side? It does, look at that. <laughs> so it unplugs from both sides, that's uh useful. Um only goes in one way, that's good. So let's move this to one side. Yeah, uh, quite clean. Right, so <laughs> here's our main board. So there's our Z80 there. And these aren't actually labelled NEC, but uh, a lot of them do use them. There's our sound chip there, general instruments. Now I'm interested about these two boards. Are these normal? Does this have an expansion? I know it's running an old ROM because uh, it comes up with a ROM version when it boots up, so we know it's an old ROM. Slightly like terrifyingly, there's a power extension block there, just kind of sitting there. There's seemingly nothing connected. <laughs> I don't know if that's normal or not. It's a bit odd if it is. Let's we take a little bit of a closer look at that. Yeah, so it's just kind of sitting in there. Good angle on that. I don't know if we can. Let's see. No, right, there you go. You can see it in there. So... Anything connected to that at all? Being slightly careful because this has just been on and the stuff will still be carrying voltages. No, there's nothing connected to it. So that's odd. I don't know if that's normal or not. <laughs> I will ask someone and probably put it down below if I find out. Uh, so for these two boards, that's obviously some kind of ROM board, so that's probably normal. Uh, this what are those chips? Ooh, coming out, I know that much. Oh, blimey, that whole board was risen. <laughs> like whatever that was, it wasn't plugged in properly. Uh, let's 
just work this out slightly because oh my god that was oh blimey oh that's a lot of corrosion you see just down there again let's zoom in that's not pleasant okay that will need to be resolved is that leaking capacitors the patterns are looking a little bit toasty. I'm not smelling anything though, so they haven't splurged entirely. And in fact, this board, other than what goes into there, looks quite quite clean. So it would seem that whatever's happened has originated there. Oh, is that glue or is that a very hot? Capacitor. I'm guessing that capacitor is not healthy. Yeah, one on the other side looks okay though. So that might just be glue. That may just be glue that's over the time has died. <sighs> so what is this board? It was almost certainly not working because it was almost completely out until I pushed it back down again. It's an official board, that's for sure. It's focus there you go it's got the EACA logo down there which of course the manufacturers of this fine machine um hmm I will also now have to look to see which way it went in yeah the more I look at it the more I'm thinking that's glue that was supposed to hold this in and over time it's just died um yeah so smash um, yeah, so that presumably is a, a memory expansion board. I didn't check the memory because I just assumed this was a normal machine. I mean, the board looks fine. The board does look fine. So like I said, I think that's probably just glue they'd use to try to glue this board in place, which given that it had risen completely out of the socket, it sounds like it was a wise move. In fact, a lot of these sockets, of course, are not holding in. So the LED isn't being held in properly over here. So I think what we'll do is we'll splay those pins a little bit so it holds in slightly better. Um, what to do? Well, first of all, I've now moved this around so often that I don't actually know where it was originally plugged in. So, or which way it was. So I will have to check the footage for that. So I'll do that in a second. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this a bit of a clean just to get that off. Like I said, I'm pretty convinced now that it's just adhesive in some description. So we'll do that. And then we'll put it back together again and make sure it still boots up. <laughs> All right, back in a bit. And there we go, the EACA. Color Genie EG2000 for <laughs> its full title. It's an interesting machine. Uh, it's really well built as well. Uh, although some of those connectors and stuff, which plan you use glue to hold things in, they're not so good. Uh, this one's working pretty well. I think there are some caps that need to be changed. The power light, even though I mucked about the connector, it's still very temperamental. It'll come on sometimes, and sometimes it won't, which suggests there's something going on with the five volt line at least. So uh, I'll probably change some of the caps in the power supply just for stability. But um, no, it does work and uh, using this Bluetooth solution is cumbersome, but it also does work. I will be making some changes to my Casduino uh, just so I can increase the gain so we can hopefully use that to load games up. It'll be a lot easier then. And um, maybe we'll co cover a few more games later on. To do that, you have to make sure you hit the bell icon to be told when future videos come out. Did that first look at that anyway thanks for watching if you like the video please hit like if you really like the video please hit subscribe if you didn't like the video or you have something else to say then please leave it in the comments below uh you could join our membership on youtube to get access to early videos and the same thing on patreon as well uh and also exclusive videos on both of those too um yeah i mean that's it i've already done the bell icon thing so uh yeah see you next time the present is horrible the future looks bleak Remember our childhood To get us through the week We're getting re-enthused Back to the past And the things we used We all know
that their pasts were great Escaping the things that today we hate Getting reinvented 